Welcome to Tanuk Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA. Another episode of A Rabbi Cross-Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael the Man Skowak. Welcome back. Skowak, how are you today? <laughs> it never gets tired. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how, how hard it was to shake that welcome back don't do crack or something like that. <laughs> that was a really hard habit to break. I'm glad we finally got to find out with that one. I'm missing Now light. it sounds like, like I'm a professional wrestler. <laughs> In the white corner. <laughs> right, right, right. You're definitely a professional, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so, all right, so here we are, facing the Battle of the Beast, Revelation chapter 13. I like it. Good, good title, Rabbi, good title. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, here we go. Welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you haven't seen the rest of the shows, go back. We got pretty much all of the New Testament covered, except for Mark, Luke, and John, which we're going to be approaching here soon. So, um, time, yeah. Time for so, uh, welcome to the Book of Revelation, my least favorite book in the Christian Bible, <laughs> but the one everybody's uh, been waiting for. I used to like it actually, but now that I'm trying to understand it, I'm just—it's—it's. <laughs> uh, I'm losing the little hair that I have left on my head. That's funny. Um, <clears throat> so, in this chapter, basically, we're going to get, I guess, a presentation of the holy, of the non-holy Trinity, um, as we'll see in a few minutes. Right. So the the chapter begins, and it's not clear there are different textual. Variance. I'm I'm going with the text that has in verse one, and he stood on the sand of the seashore. Now, presumably, this is referring back to chapter twelve, where the he was the dragon, um, and so it seems that what it's beginning here with is the idea that this dragon that was described in chapter twelve, and the dragon in chapter 12 was ultimately identified in verse 9 as Satan. So this um, horrible red dragon, fire-breathing dragon, um, is essentially uh, a symbol, uh, another identity, uh, some kind of a... Um, whatever, <laughs> it's supposed to be Satan, because that's clearly stated in chapter 12, verse 9. So he's standing now on the sand of the seashore, and John, in his vision, says, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. Now, I want you to remember that phrase. It's going to be significant that this beast is coming out of the sea. And now, again, it has another one of these bizarre, scary descriptions of this weird beast that has ten horns, and seven heads, and on the horns were ten diadems, or ten royal crowns, and on his head were blasphemous names. Sounds like a pretty hideous creature. Now, what's interesting is that this great red dragon that was described back in chapter 12 is described as having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems or seven royal crowns. So the Satan has seven of these royal crowns on his heads, whereas this beast from the sea has these ten royal crowns, ten diadems on the ten horns. So it's pretty similar, but not exactly the same. Now, who this beast is that's emerging from the sea is certainly not clear. I mean, anyone just picking up this chapter and reading it, it doesn't identify or clarify who this beast is, at least at this point. And many Christians assume or assert that it symbolizes what they refer to as the anti-Messiah or the anti-Christ. And sometimes either and or either, meaning some Christians understand this to be representing the Antichrist, which is both a person and a worldwide government or empire, which many Christians identify with Rome, although again, not all Christians. And so basically the beast is seen as 
either representing a being, a being that is referred to as the anti-Christ, or it's referring to a uh, worldwide powerful empire, or both, that it, it represents both. And in verse 2, it says that this beast was like a leopard. Now it gets very, very uh, bizarre. So the beast not only had um, 10 horns and 10 royal crowns and seven heads, but the beast was like a leopard, we're told in verse 2, with feet like a bear. So it's getting stranger and stranger. Uh, so the beast was like a leopard and it had feet like a bear and mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, again, the dragon is identified as Satan in chapter 12. So the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So apparently what's going on here, according to the way most Christians understand this, is that this antichrist, either being or, or government, is receiving power from Satan. Now, what's interesting is, and we've seen this so many times already in the book of Revelation, that the writer of Revelation, whoever it is, clearly would not have gotten out of bed in the morning had he not been familiar with imagery from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew scriptures. So this beast that's described here in Revelation, the beginning of Revelation chapter 13, is clearly drawn from imagery based upon Daniel chapter 7. We're told in Daniel chapter 7 that Daniel sees in his vision four beasts. Three of them are depicted as a lion, a bear, and a leopard, exactly as uh, John sees this beast here in verse 2, a combination of leopard, bear, and lion. Um, but what's interesting is that Daniel sees them as different uh, beasts. Daniel sees in his vision four beasts, which will represent four empires. Uh, John here seems to amalgamate them. They all get sort of wrapped up into one really bizarre, weird kind of creature, which is a combination of leopard and bear and lion, oh my. And what's interesting is that Daniel's um, beasts come out of the sea. So again, D uh, John here is very clearly borrowing, you could even say lifting, I'm not sure plagiarizing is polite, but the, the, the language is basically identical, where you have these, these, these animals that are identified with the beast coming out of the sea, and then Daniel's fourth beast is very horrifying. It's really a, a, a horrifying beast. And his beast is described, this fourth beast of Daniel, is described as having ten horns, which again is just like John's beast coming out of the sea here that has ten horns. Now, traditional Jewish understanding is that the four beasts of Daniel's vision represent the empires of Babylonia, of Persia, of Greece, and of Rome. And Rome, again, in Jewish consciousness, the, the fourth beast that Daniel sees is understood, Rome is understood not simply as the Roman Empire from, from 2,000 years ago, but to conceptually be representing historical uh, continuation of Rome through Christianity, essentially. So Rome becomes almost a code word for Christendom or the church. Um, and that's normally how Jewish readers understand Daniel's four beasts. So in verse three, John says, and I saw one of its heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound had healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Quite amazing that what, what John seems to be say, saying here is that either this beast actually had a mortal wound, and some Christian commentaries that I saw believe that he actually died. 
that this beast died. It was a mortal, mortal, mortal wound means that you die from it. Um, or that it was, it seemed like a mortal wound, but it actually wasn't, or it was fake. There were different ways in which this is understood. Because in John's language, it says one of its heads, heads had as if it had been more as if it had been mortally wounded. So it's not at all clear. But what's amazing is that the fact that this beast recovers from what seems to be a mortal wound has the whole world just going crazy, marveling, like, look, that's so amazing that this guy was shot in the head or whatever, and he's now he's walking around. Uh, the whole world follows the beast. They all become acolytes and they all become followers of the beast. Now, this verse is understood in usually one of two ways. It's referring to either the apparent end of a political empire that will have a resurgence. So again, the mortal wound to this beast is not of a person, a being, it's of an empire, a government. And so many people understand this is somehow referring to uh, some government um, usually identified as something associated with the Roman Empire that seemed to be out of commission, seemed to be facing its last days, and then it has some tremendous resurgence. That is one way in which Christian commentaries seem to understand verse 3, or according to those who see the beast as the Antichrist, as an individual, it would refer to someone who seemed dead, and experienced an apparent resurrection. Or, again, according to some Christian commentaries, someone who was killed and who was resurrected. In any event, verse 4 says that they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And who is they? So they obviously refers back to the whole world that was mentioned in the previous verse, in verse 3. So the whole world, we're told now, worship the dragon. The dragon is Satan who gave authority to the beast. The beast is this being that uh, seems to have been resurrected. And we're told that they worship the beast, the whole world. The whole world worships the dragon and the whole world worships the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this is obviously a ghastly prediction that the whole world is going to come to worship Satan and his minions. And the question I would ask is, where in the Tanakh do we see such an eventuality that's forecast? Where do you see anywhere in Tanakh that somehow, uh, you know, in the end times, the entire world is going to worship Satan and Satan's underlings? Um, the emphasis in the Tanakh, when you read through the passages in Tanakh that deal with the end times, the passages emphasize the whole world embracing God, the whole world coming to embrace the light of the Jewish people. You see this in Isaiah chapter 60, uh, Zechariah chapter 8, that the whole world is going to come to the Jewish people to find out about God. And ultimately, the whole world is going to embrace the creator. The whole world is going to embrace God. You don't see predictions of the whole world embracing Satan and, and any kind of, uh, you know, underling of Satan. Um, now, the second thing is, and it's interesting, that John MacArthur here in his commentary says that people in the world will be astounded and fascinated when Antichrist appears to rise from the dead. His charisma, brilliance, and attractive but deluding powers will cause the world to follow him unquestioningly. Now, what I find interesting is that his description of the Antichrist, right, he says again, that the whole world will be fast astounded and fascinated when Antichrist appears to rise from the dead. 
and with his charisma, brilliance, and attractive but deluding powers will cause the world to follow him unquestioningly. And it seems to me that these are exactly the things that the Christian Bible claims led people to embrace Jesus unquestioningly. Um, People seem to, and I'll get into this a little bit later, people seem to accept Jesus with almost no reason to accept him unquestioningly. And Jesus demands unquestioning obedience and loyalty. And yet, what is it that attracts people to Jesus. It seems very similar to what attracts people here to the Antichrist. Now, David Stern, in his Jewish New Testament commentary, says that the authority of the beast comes through the dragon. Again, the dragon, we know, is identified as Satan. So the authority of this Antichrist comes through the dragon, which is Satan. But Stern says The ultimate source of all authority is God, which we have to say he's right. But the question is that he doesn't really explain what he means here. He leaves it at that. He just says the authority of the beast comes through the dragon, but the ultimate source of all authority is God. And he doesn't explain what he means. If I was able to sit down and have a few questions with him, I would ask, does he believe that the dragon and the beast are doing the will of God. Meaning that if the ultimate, he's saying that the authority of the beast comes through the dragon and the ultimate source of all authority is God. So it it seems that the dragon and the beast essentially are doing the will of God. Because if the beast is doing the will of the dragon and everyone is under the authority of God, So I would ask David Stern, does he believe that the dragon and the beast are doing the will of God? Or does he believe that Satan has rebelled against God and is pursuing his own agenda? Which does he believe? In other words, is Satan on God's team or does Satan lead an opposing team against God? And if God is the source of all authority, how in the world do you have a rogue Satan working at cross purposes to God? Did God send the beast on a mission to blaspheme against himself? I mean, we're told that that's what the beast is going to do, to blaspheme against God. And if the beast is under the authority of God, So is that what we're being led to believe, that God sent the beast on a mission to blaspheme against God? Um, Again, we'll we'll see that in verse 6, which is what the beast is going to do. And if that's the case, if God sent the beast on a mission to blaspheme against himself, against God himself, what would the purpose be? So these are very, very difficult questions, and I'm not sure how... David Stern, or any Christian for that matter, would respond to this. In verse 5, we're told, he, again, the beast now, we're discussing this beast, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is three and a half years. So it's not clear from the verse itself who gave the beast this circumscribed amount of time who it says he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and was given authority to continue for 42 months who is it that gave the beast this authority for three and a half years so it's not clear from the text john macarthur in his commentary says that it's the almighty it's god himself that allowed the beast to operate for a period of three and a half years now many Christian commentaries, quite a few, claim that this period of three and a half years, when the beast will be on this short leash, um, corresponds to the 70th week in Daniel's prophecy from Daniel chapter 9, which speaks about the 70 weeks of years. So many, many Christian commentaries 
take this period where the Antichrist has three and a half years to operate, and they say that it corresponds to the last part of the 70th week in Daniel's timeline. Now, this, of course, is a massive distortion of the passage in Daniel. Daniel speaks about a period of 70 weeks of years, which is, according to everyone, a period of 490 years. Daniel begins by saying that this period of seven weeks of years has been decreed on your people, Daniel. So there is a period spoken of 490 years. And the text in Daniel lays out the timeline by describing in verse 25 what will first happen after seven weeks of years, which again is a period of 49 years. So Daniel says that an anointed ruler, a Mashiach Nagid, an anointed ruler will appear. And it's clear from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21, and Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, and other places in scripture that this anointed one, this anointed ruler, is the king of Persia, Cyrus, Koresh, because he's the one that basically gave the people in Babylon permission to return to Israel and rebuild the temple. So that's the anointed ruler who comes after the period of seven weeks of years of 49 years in Daniel's timeline. And then in verse 26, Daniel says what will happen after a following 62 weeks of years, which is 434 years. So 434 years later, we're told that an anointed, not an anointed ruler, but an anointed, anointed one could be anointed more than one, will be cut off, Daniel says, and the temple will be destroyed. These two things will happen essentially at the same time, that after 62 weeks of years, there's going to be an anointed one that will be cut off and the temple is going to be destroyed. And then in verse 27, what Daniel describes is sort of a fine tuning of the last week, the last seven years, the 70th week in this period, in this period of 490 years. And he describes a prince who will destroy Jerusalem, will confirm a covenant for seven years, and then put an end to sacrifices after three and a half years. That's how Daniel basically describes this timeline of 490 years. However, there is absolutely zero, absolutely zero justification for going into Daniel 9, taking the last seven of last seven years of the period described as 490 years and separating those last seven years out of the passage and keeping it, keeping those seven years in suspended animation for thousands of years. And then they only appear on the stage of history in, in the end times, thousands of years after what Daniel is describing. No person on the planet reading the Daniel, Daniel chapter nine would ever have any reason to believe that that 70th week was disconnected from the rest of Daniel's timeline. He simply speaks about 490 years and then he explains what's going to happen in those 490 years. There's absolutely zero justification for taking the last seven years and whoop, just taking them away from Daniel chapter nine and moving them way, 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 way into the end times, into the future. Now in verse six, uh, he again describes what this beast is gonna do. He's gonna open his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And in verse seven, it was granted to him, to the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And in verse eight, so John says that all who dwell on earth will worship him. Again, it's quite amazing 
that the whole world is going to worship this beast, the Antichrist, apparently, whose names have not been written in the book of life, meaning who is going to be worshiping the Antichrist? It's all those people whose names have not been written in the book of life, the book of life of the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So according to some Christian commentaries, this implies that the names of who would be written in the book of life were written there from the foundation of the world, meaning the beginning of time. So Christians refer to these people as the elect, and they were chosen by God to receive eternal life. And this touches on the difficult subject of predestination, uh, which I'm not going to get into today. It's maybe for another time. Um, then in verse 9 and 10, John says that if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And he's saying now, pay attention. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. It's not really clear what in the world this is talking about, what it means, why he brings this up. Many Christian commentaries say that it's basically saying that the believers in Jesus will have to put up with a lot of persecution and they'll just basically put up with it. Uh, it's not really clear to me what in the world this verse means. In verse 11, we now get into the second part of this chapter when John says, and then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth this time. So the first beast that we saw in the beginning of the chapter comes up out of the ocean, out of the sea. This second beast is coming up out of the earth and he had only two horns. Um, so it's a, it's a much less impressive looking beast like a lamb. So just like a lamb has two little stubs coming out of its head, not much for, in terms of horns. Um, that's the kind of horns that this second beast has coming up out of the earth. And it spoke like a dragon. So even though it has two horns like a lamb, this second beast that's coming out of the earth speaks like a dragon. Now, what in the world is this beast? I mean, <laughs> it, it again, what, what's so uh, really difficult about this book of Revelation is that the imagery is so both um, vivid and yet nondescript, meaning that it, it can, it, and not just that it can be interpreted in many, many, many different ways, it is interpreted in many, many different ways by Christians over the past 2,000 years. So what is this second beast coming out of the earth. So some Christian commentaries, I would think the majority, at least of Protestant evangelical commentaries say that the beast here is the false prophet. And this is the third character, if you will, in the whole, in the non-holy trinity. So in this chapter, we've had uh, the dragon mentioned, who's the, the Satan. And then we've had the first beast, which is the antichrist. And now the second beast, according to some, is the false prophet. These are the three bad hombres that are presented in this chapter. The Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And we're going to see the false prophet explicitly mentioned in chapter 16, verse 13. So we'll get to him down the road. So that's how many Christians understand this second beast. Um, other Christian commentaries identify this beast as the Antichrist, believe it or not. Not everyone was sold on the first beast being the Antichrist. Others identify this beast, um, again, not as a being, but as a, uh, a group, as a basically the religious leaders in Jerusalem who rejected Jesus. That's how some Christian commentaries understand this second beast, that it's the cabal of Jewish religious leaders at the time of Jesus that rejected him. Others see this beast as the custodians of the Roman civil religion, um, which is basically their cult of emperors. And these are just four. There are other ways in which Christians have understood 
the second beast. And once again, what we see here is that Revelation is basically a Rorschach test in so many ways that um, the imagery is so nondescript that readers can see a dizzying array of possible interpretations, usually based upon their own prior assumptions about the meaning of this book and the meaning of uh, the way this book fits into the rest of the Christian Bible. So once again, what I wanted to mention is that the Hebrew scriptures contain a significant amount of eschatological material, meaning that you have a significant amount of material in the Hebrew scriptures that describes the end times, but nothing along these lines of revelation where there's going to be an end time, end times false prophet who will serve as the mouthpiece of Satan and who will be worshipped by the entire world along with Satan. I mean, totally out of sync with whatever was revealed in the Hebrew Bible. In verse 12, uh, John tells us that he exercises this second beast, that he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and all who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs in verse 13, great signs, this false prophet, if we want to identify the second beast as the false prophet, he performs great signs in verse 13, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And in verse 14, this is an important verse, John says, and he deceives those who dwell on earth by those signs he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now, I believe that this verse and the ones that preceded it a, a bit present a really serious problem for a major platform of Christianity. Christianity is based upon the claim that Jesus was the Christ, meaning Jesus was the Messiah. That's the, the name of the religion. Christianity means that it's a religion founded upon the proposition that the Christ, the Messiah, came in the person of Jesus. That's the claim of Christianity, the basic, basic, basic claim. Um, the question is, what is the basis for this claim? What is, how do we substantiate this claim that Jesus was the Messiah? At the end of the day, there is absolutely no basis. It's simply a belief. It's a claim that is made that Jesus was the Messiah. There's absolutely zero evidence. The first conversion story in the Christian Bible proves this. So if you go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 to 20, so it describes how Simon Peter and his brother Andrew basically follow Jesus on the basis of nothing. They see him uh, at, the, at the sea, and Jesus says, follow me, I'll make you the fishers of men. And they basically leave their lives behind. They just stop whatever they were doing in their life and they follow Jesus. Now, if you read that story, you would wonder on the basis of what? Why are they leaving everything in their life behind and following this person just because he says, follow me and I'll make you the fishers of men? What did Jesus do to give himself any credibility that anyone should listen to him at that point? So that would clearly not really be a winning formula for promoting a world religion. Right? You're not going to really get far by telling everybody, just follow me because I say so. So what the Christian Bible did as a major plank of its case for Jesus, meaning in order to make it credible 
that people should believe in Jesus, what do the Gospels do? The Gospels basically make the claim that you should believe in Jesus as the Messiah because he performed many miracles proving that he was the Messiah. Let me just share two places where this is essentially said. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these, meaning the, the ones that were recorded in this book, these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. So John is saying it right out, that the miracle stories recorded in the Gospels were written in order to convince people that they should believe Jesus was the Messiah. And then you have a very similar passage in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22. where it says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Right? How do we know that Jesus was anyone worth following? Because God accredited him with miracles, wonders, and signs. This is a major, and that's why the four gospels have so many stories of the various alleged miracles that Jesus performs. This is a major, major plank in the case that the Christian Bible makes for Jesus. The obvious problem with this is that God never told us in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures, that we will be able to recognize the Messiah through the miracles that he will do. This is simply something that God never tells us. And why is that? Why doesn't God in the Hebrew Bible tell us that that would be a way that will recognize the Messiah? The answer is very simple. Because in the Hebrew scriptures, miracles do not prove anything. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, God warns us in advance. God tells us that there will be false prophets who will be able to perform incredible signs and wonders. And God says, don't listen to them. They're false prophets. Now, one might ask, if they're false prophets, why did God give them the ability to do these incredible miracles? And God himself answers that question in Deuteronomy 13. God says, he'll be testing us to see whether we're going to fall for the pyrotechnics and the impressive miracles of this false prophet, or we're going to stick with him, with what God has clearly revealed to us. So what we see in, in Deuteronomy is that miracles are not a proof for anything. And what's interesting is that the Christian Bible basically accepts this premise. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, so Jesus says himself that in the future there will be false messiahs who will come, who will perform incredible signs and wonders and miracles, and they will mislead many people, even the elect, meaning that people can be misled by miracles. Miracles can be performed by, as we see here in this chapter of Revelation, chapter 13, by the by the false prophet, or some say that this is the Antichrist, will be performing these amazing miracles. And who's going to be impressed? Well, it says here, the entire world. The whole world is going to worship Satan and worship the Antichrist. And we see this, we'll see it again in chapter 16 of Revelation, verse 14. We're going to see it again in chapter 19, verse 20 in Revelation where these really satanic beings perform incredible miracles and mislead people. We also saw it previously when we studied the book of 2 Thessalonians 
in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that the wicked and evil demonic forces of the world are able to produce incredible miracles. So the obvious question is that if false messiahs, if false messiahs and false prophets can do miracles, then how could a miracle ever prove that someone is the real Messiah. So this is a massive, massive problem for a major portion of the Christian Bible, which again puts so much stock in the miracles that Jesus did. Actually, I, I think I've told this story before that when I was living in Philadelphia, so I met a young Jewish kid that had basically joined a church and I asked him, you know, how is it that you came to uh, be converted in the church and he said because of all the miracles that I saw and I asked him what miracles did you see and he told me these really lame miracles he said he went to the church for a, for a prayer meeting and his back wasn't feeling good and he came out and his fat his back was feeling better anyway so I asked him do you believe that miracles can prove that a religion is true and he said of course that's why I became a Christian because of the miracles that he saw so I said to him, if miracles can prove that a religion is true, I asked him, how do you account for the miracles that I've seen? I said, I've seen incredible miracles. And he said, really, what did you see? So I told him some you know, I thought were pretty amazing, at least as good as his feel, back feeling better. I told him that in 1977, I was driving to a wedding in Detroit and in Pennsylvania, my car went over a cliff and it flipped over about 10, 15 times, and it was literally squashed flat. And I came out of that car essentially without any inj injuries. Um, I thought that was pretty miraculous. And then I told him about when I was studying in Israel, my roommate had a cousin that was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer, and they didn't have any hope that he would survive. And we all prayed, and this person recovered. So. I said, I've seen incredible miracles myself. How do you account for those miracles? That they prove that Judaism is true. And he said, of course not. He said, those miracles that you saw were done by Satan to confuse you. That's, that's how you saw those miracles. Wow, that's funny. Satan did those miracles to confuse you. Satan wants you to stay Jewish. Satan doesn't want you to come to Jesus. So Satan did all these miracles for you to keep you a loyal, believing Jew that would keep you away from Jesus so that you'll burn in hell forever. So I said, I said, wow. So I said, you believe Satan goes around the world doing miracle, miracles to confuse people? He said, of course, that's his job. So I asked this boy, I said, well, how do you know the miracles you saw weren't done by Satan to confuse you? And there was a moment, <laughs> you can just see in his eyes, a moment of, wow, you know, like, how do, how do I know? But again, he couldn't accept that possibility. So, you know, he had to go back and essentially, you know, assert that that's not possible. The miracles he saw had to be from God. The miracles I saw had to be from, from Satan. Um, so the, the chapter ends in a very fascinating way. I, I don't have enough time to really go into it fully. It's quite fascinating. In verses 16 and 17, John basically says that the beast is going to ultimately force everyone who wants to buy or sell um, to have a mark that's going to be placed on their right hand or on their forehead. And this mark is going to be the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name of the beast. And he says in verse 18, the last verse of the chapter, that the number of the beast is the number of a man. The number of the beast is the number of a man. And he says it's going to be 666. 666, although some ancient manuscripts have 616, 616. It seems that most people believe that it's 666. And there's been incredible speculation about the meaning of this number 666, many Christians say that it's, a, it's a symbol of man, because again, he says that the number of the beast is a number of a man, 
man was created on the sixth day, six is seen as a number of being less than seven, which is the number of perfection. Seven would be the number of God, of perfection. Six is a symbol of man who is less than perfect. And 666 would be basically a way of indicating that this beast is, you know, quite below perfection, quite below God. Um, many people over the past 2000 years have tried to compute uh, using the numerical value of various languages, using Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, <laughs> many different languages, Latin, you know, what might these numbers add up to if you take the, the alphabet, uh, the alphabetical uh, numerical value of different names, many people have said that this 666 somehow corresponds to Nero Caesar. Um, many other names have been suggested as working out to 666. Um, I'll just end by throwing in two wacky ideas of my own. So one, this is obviously just tongue in cheek, but one is if you go to the Gospel of John, chapter six, verse 66. So again, that would be 666, John chapter six, verse 66. It speaks about all of the disciples that were no longer following Jesus. So if this beast is somehow associated with the Antichrist and with Satan, you know, that would be exactly what their mission is to do, is to pull people away from Jesus. So that might be one possible illusion. I haven't seen this in any Christian sources. And the other one, which I think someone told me a long time ago, is, you know, in Toronto, we have a basketball team called the Raptors. Um, but if you ever saw like, a, you know, a movie of, with dinosaurs and, and raptors and those kind of animals. So if you look at their, their claw prints, if you ever see what their claw prints look like, it, it's basically three lines. It's like they, they, they made their claw prints on something, you know, and you have basically the mark of, the, of this beast, of this raptor, of this ancient dinosaur is six, is three lines, three vertical lines. In Hebrew, a vertical line like that is the letter Vav, which is the number six. So three lines like this would be essentially six, six, six. Vav, Vav, Vav. Is that really the meaning of this passage? I have no idea, but I just wanted to share it. Okay, uh, that's all she wrote for all right. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> and uh, I look forward to... That's great. Uh, our next time together when we'll do hopefully Revelation 14 and we'll be over with this book soon. <laughs> Get back to more normal prose. Yes, 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 yes. I found it funny that uh, one time there was a guy, I was at a gas station and uh, he had uh, this demonic tattoos on him and he had 666 tattooed right across, huge numbers across his chest when he had like a, all this other weird stuff. And I said, that's an interesting tattoo. I said, you know the number's really not 666, right? He goes, what? What do you mean not? <laughs> Dude, he was completely distraught because he had a massive tattoo. Anyway, it's funny. Yeah. He should get his money back. He should get his money back. <laughs> <laughs> At least for one of those numbers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Rabbi, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to tune in weekly uh, for, for each show. And like I said, even once once we finish Revelation, we're going to double back and hit Mark and then Luke and John. And not sure exactly how fast or how if it's going to be like super, super tight or if it's going to be really, uh, really, really explanatory, not really sure. But either way, we're not letting Skowak go. <laughs> we want to keep him around here as long as we can. So, Rabbi, thank you again for your time and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Peace out, everybody. Shalom. All the best. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom.
חשוב והכרחי להיות ביחד. איפוק זו העוצמה, ויתור זו הגדולה, השאיפה. <שאיפה> 